Do you know which Pokemon has won the most world championships? What's that? Incineroar, you say? Well, actually, no, yeah, you'd be right. It is Incineroar after all. It's won every single world championship it's been legal in. But if you're a boomer like me, you may remember that Metagross also won three world championships, making it tied with Incineroar for the most ever. While Incineroar is the current king of competitive Pokemon, having won three of the last five world championships, Metagross, much like myself sadly, is the washed up king, having won three of the first five world championships. So what made a Pokemon who used to be as dominant as Incineroar is today fall off so hard? And is there any hope that the Scarlet and Violet DLC will return Metagross to its former glory? Well, as the last person to actually win the World Championships with Metagross, let me answer those questions. But first, we need to take a look back at the story of Metagross's complete competitive history. Let's start with Diamond and Pearl, back in 2008 and 2009 when the official competitive Pokemon circuit first began. Metagross was, without a doubt, one of, if not the best Pokemon in the entire game. It had sky-high attack and phenomenal defenses to back it up, strong 100 base power moves to take advantage of its high attack in Meteor Mash and Earthquake, an ability to block any attempts to lower its attack, and even access to a priority move in Bullet Punch whenever it needed to bypass its mediocre speed stat to finish off a weakened opponent before they could move. But I haven't even gotten to the two biggest reasons that Metagross was on every team. First is its type, Steel and Psychic. At the time, this combination was arguably the best type combination of any existing Pokemon. Metagross had nine resistances, but only two weaknesses. Yeah, Steel types actually used to resist Ghost and Dark type attacks, canceling out the Psychic type's weakness to them. The second reason might actually blow your mind if you weren't playing competitively back in Generation 4. And I mean this literally, because I'm talking about the move Explosion. But what's so important about Explosion? Well, despite its listed base power being 250, it would actually have all Pokemon's defense prior to doing damage, effectively giving it a base power of 500. To put this in perspective, Metagross's Explosion was just about as strong as a Choice Specs Kyogre's full powered water spout in the rain. But Metagross was able to abuse Explosion even further with its held item. While other items like Shookaberry, Okaberry, and Lumberry were more common choices, Custap Berry was also a really good choice. Because of Metagross's typing and stats, it was really hard to knock it out in one hit. When Metagross's HP fell below 25%, the Custap Berry would activate, causing its next move to go before most other moves in the game. Since matches back then were best of one, single elimination, with no open team sheets, whenever you were inches from KOing a Metagross, it could completely surprise you, suddenly launching an explosion KOing your entire field before you even got a chance to move. Because explosion defined the competitive landscape back then, Metagross also being one of the few Pokemon that could actually survive the attack made it essential on many teams. Metagross would go on to win both the 2008 and 2009 World Championships, but with much more unique sets. The 2008 Worlds winning Metagross passed up on Explosion in favor of Psych Up to turn it into a sweeper under Trick Room when paired with Belly Drum Snorlax. While the 2009 world's winning Metagross utilized unexpected explosions in a different way, opting for the Choice Scarf held item. Metagross had so many different ways it could be used and each one was just as effective. 2010 would introduce the restricted legendaries like Dialga, Kyogre, and Mewtwo. Players could only use a maximum of two in every battle, so the normal, non-restricted Pokemon were still key to victory. Even in a format with massive threats like Groudon and Ho-Oh, Metagross was still capable of fighting amongst them. The biggest reason for that was, again, Explosion. Even a lot of these restricted legendaries just weren't capable of surviving the attack. 
If you were able to trade your Metagross for an opposing Restricted Legendary thanks to Explosion, that was a huge win for you. Ultimately, even though Metagross didn't have a single appearance on any of the top 8 teams from that year's World Championships, it actually won numerous national and regional level events worldwide. Let's move on to Generation 5, with the release of Black and White. 2011, the first year of competition on the new games, only allowed the use of Pokemon natively found in the Unova region. Metagross, unfortunately, was not allowed. But in 2012, players were free to use Metagross just as they were in the previous years. Only this time, Metagross would see its first nerf from Game Freak, as Explosion would no longer have all Pokemon's defense prior to doing damage. Meaning, Metagross wouldn't be capable of one-hit KOing most Pokemon in the game with it anymore. But this nerf wasn't enough to keep Metagross from dominating the competitive scene, as it would simply change the way that it was used. By far the most popular and successful way of using Metagross this generation was as a pair with Cresselia. Cresselia would have the move Trick Room, which worked well with Metagross's mediocre speed. Once Trick Room was up, Cresselia would use Swagger on Metagross, whose Lumberry held item would instantly cure the confusion, resulting in a free two stages of boosted attack that couldn't even be lowered by Intimidate thanks to its clear body ability. From there, Metagross could go on to sweep with Meteor Mash or Earthquake, which it could freely use thanks to Cresselia's Levitate ability. Once Trick Room expired, it could still hit hard before opponents moved thanks to Bullet Punch. Some players, though, preferred more immediate burst damage as opposed to the setup Swagger and Lumberry required and opted for either a normal gem set, which almost brought Explosion back to its power level in the previous generation, or Choice Band, which gave all of its moves a 50% power boost. Also working in Metagross's favor, was the fact that 2012 was the year of the dragon, literally. Many players would actually have two dragon types on their team. Fairy types didn't exist yet, so even more priority was placed on having a good steel type like Metagross on your team, as it was essential to have a Pokemon capable of withstanding powerful dragon gem boosted Draco Meteors. I ended up winning worlds that year, going undefeated the entire tournament, relying heavily on the aforementioned Swagger, Cresselia, and Lumberry Metagross strategy, and it was definitely my team's MVP. Generation 6 was weird for Metagross. It introduced a significant nerf that I alluded to earlier, but also brought some huge buffs as well. Metagross had to wait until 2015 with the release of Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire to be allowed, but it was one of the lucky few to come with a Mega Evolution. And unlike fellow pseudo-legendary Garchomp's Mega Evolution, Metagross's was actually pretty good. It became a lot faster upon Mega Evolving, being able to outspeed Pokemon like Zapdos, Landorus, and Mega Kangaskhan. But it had one big downside. Because of the way turn order worked, the turn Metagross Mega Evolved, the order of which Pokemon moves first, would still be calculated off of its original mediocre speed stat, not its Mega's new faster speed stat. The trade-off though was the significant damage boost it got thanks to Mega Metagross's new ability, Tough Claws, which boosts the power of all moves that make physical contact. Moves like Meteor Mash, Bullet Punch, Ice Punch, and Stomping Tantrum became a whopping 33% stronger. So Mega Evolution was an obvious buff for Metagross, but let's talk about the type chart next. Generation 6 introduced the Fairy type, which certainly made Steel types like Metagross even more valuable, as not only did Steel resist Fairy type attacks, but it also hit Fairies back for super effective damage. However, starting in Generation 6, Steel no longer resisted Dark and Ghost type attacks, which was significant as those former resistances was what made Steel pair so well with Metagross's part psychic typing. Now that the number of Metagross's type weaknesses doubled from 2 to 4, it became a lot easier for players to KO. 
Honestly, of all the buffs and nerfs that Metagross has gotten over the years, this singular steel type nerf is probably the biggest of them all and is the main reason for the decline in Metagross over the years. Aside from Mega Evolution and the type chart, Metagross also had a slight rework to the move Meteor Mash. Its base power was decreased from 100 to 90, but its accuracy was raised from 85 to 90. Every player has a different perspective on the trade-off between move power and move accuracy. But since Metagross already learned Iron Head as a reliable steel type move, which was also boosted by Tough Claws, and had a flinch chance that paired well with Mega Metagross's high speed, many players simply opted to use that instead of the slightly stronger but more inaccurate Meteor Mesh. Mega Metagross had some decent results in 2015 with a handful of second place finishes at regional and national level events. Even though it was a strong pick, it was only around the 30th most used Pokemon. The reason it wasn't anything exceptional that year was because of a little thing called opportunity cost. There were a lot of other incredibly strong Megas available, like Mega Kangaskhan and Charizard Y, that players would have to give up using if they wanted to use Mega Metagross. The thing is, there's no real non-Mega alternative for those other Megas, but there were non-Mega alternatives for players who wanted a strong bulky steel type like Heatran or Aegislash. Heading into 2016, like what usually happens in the last year of a generation, players were allowed to use two restricted legendaries on their team, which meant Metagross would be fighting against powerful Pokemon like Kyogre, Xerneas, and Mewtwo. Xerneas was one of the most dominant Pokemon in the entire game at the time, thanks to its Power Herb and Geomancy combo. You would think Mega Metagross would have had some success as a fast steel type capable of one hit KOing it, but it was actually incredibly rare and didn't find much success at all. The reason was, again, due to the alternative Megas available. Sure, Mega Metagross offered a lot of damage, but Mega Kangaskhan and Salamence did as well, and damage wasn't all they brought to the table. They could also help support the rest of the team with Fake Out and Tailwind, respectively. This made them much more desirable choices for players due to their versatility on the battlefield. It was actually another non-Mega Steel Psychic type that was seeing a ton of success instead, Bronzong. Bronzong not only similarly offered a ton of damage against Xerneas with Gyro Ball taking advantage of the Geomancy boost, but it also offered support in the form of Trick Room, Gravity, and Hypnosis. Even though Metagross got that new Mega Evolution, it was actually a bit of a disappointment this generation, all things considered. Generation 7, however, saw Metagross have a bit of a resurgence. Metagross was included as part of the Alola Pokedex, so it was able to take part in the limited regional dex format of 2017 where it actually captured three regional championship victories, including one by none other than Aaron, Aaron Cybertron, Cybertron Zen, Zen, where he used a Psychic Terrain-based team featuring Tapu Lele and Psychic Seed on Bird and Driftlin that could set up a fast tailwind to enable his choice band Metagross to fire off incredibly strong terrain-boosted Zen headbutts. However, what wound up being the most successful use of Metagross was by World's semi-finalist Tomoyuki Yoshimura, who used a weakness policy Metagross alongside a bulldoze Salamence. Salamence would lower the speed of all opposing Pokemon with bulldoze, so that Metagross could outspeed them, and Metagross would not only get two stages of increased attack thanks to the weakness policy, but also its clear body ability would protect its own speed from being lowered. But Metagross's Generation 7 success wouldn't stop there. 2018 and 2019 would reintroduce Metagross's Mega Evolution from Generation 6, only this time things would be a lot different. Unlike Generation 6, the turn order would be decided after Mega Evolving. As an example, imagine if a player led with Swampert and Drizzle Pelipper, to immediately set up the rain. In Generation 6, if that player decided to Mega Evolve their Swampert on turn 1, the turn order would be calculated based on Swampert's original speed and ability prior to Mega Evolve. 
However, now in Generation 7, the turn order would be decided using Mega Swampert's speed and ability, which in this case is Swift Swim, giving it that massive speed boost immediately upon Mega Evolving. This change was huge for Pokemon with Mega Evolutions that were significantly faster than their base forms, one of which being Metagross, whose Mega was way faster. Not only did Metagross get this buff, but Mega Kangaskhan and Salamence suffered a nerf this generation as both Parental Bond and Aerial Eight's damage increase was reduced. Metagross was now much more in contention for the title of Strongest Mega, and tournament results reinforced that, as Metagross managed to win a whopping 11 regional championships, and 3 international championships, all in 2018. Even though it didn't make either finalist team at the World Championships that year, it had a phenomenal season as the most used Mega Evolution across the entire year. 2019 reintroduced the Restricted Legendaries, which in turn meant that the versatility with which Mega Kangaskhan, Mega Salamence, and Mega Gengar could offer support to their team caused them to have both more usage and more success than Mega Metagross, just as in 2016. But this time, Metagross had a much better showing as it was able to win a regional championship, finish second at an international championship, and even reach the top four at the world championship. Sword and Shield, of course, had the infamous Dexit, which saw Metagross and many others excluded from the Gaylor region. Metagross's Generation 8 appearance had to wait until October of 2020, when it was released into the game via the DLC. Metagross immediately became a very strong Dynamax option, and was one of the top 10 most used Pokemon in the few months after the DLC dropped. Metagross was immune to Intimidate, its common attacking types of Steel and Ground, both had phenomenal side effects once Dynamaxed, as they would boost both Metagross and its allies defense and special defense respectively, and to top it all off, it was able to take advantage of the weakness policy held item an item that really defined the Dynamax era. The bonus HP would allow you to attack your own Pokemon with a super effective move and take little damage, instantly activating the weakness policy boost. But Metagross was strong enough that it didn't necessarily need the boost, and simply having the weakness policy could scare opponents from attacking it with super effective moves unless they were sure to knock it out. Something that was almost impossible to do if Metagross was Dynamax. Ultimately though, due to the pandemic causing the shutdown of in-person tournaments, Metagross didn't have much of a chance to show how strong it was in official competitive play in Sword and Shield. By the time official tournaments returned, the restricted legendaries were already allowed, and while Metagross was strong when Dynamaxed, there were too many incredibly strong Pokemon that just had too good of a matchup against it, like G-Max Charizard, Groudon, Calyrex Shadow Rider, and Kyogre. And that leads us into Scarlet and Violet, where like Sword and Shield before it, Metagross has been released into the game via DLC. Fortunately for Metagross, it got some small buffs this generation. Previously, Metagross's strongest Steel and Psychic type moves were Meteor Mash and Zen Headbutt, two moves with only 90% accuracy. Their base power only being 90 and 80 respectively aren't even all that high to make up for the lower accuracy. Accurate. However, now Metagross has access to Heavy Slam and Psychic Fangs, which, thanks to their 100% accuracy, are a lot more reliable. Not only that, thanks to Metagross's massive weight, Heavy Slam will often be even stronger than Meteor Mash, going all the way up to 120 base power against most targets. Psychic Fang's 85 base power is higher than the more inaccurate Zen Headbutt, and has the added benefit of clearing the opponent's light screen and reflect. Metagross also gained access to Knock Off as a strong yet supportive coverage move. Metagross still has Clear Body, giving it immunity to Intimidate as well as to Incineroar's Parting Shot. Its Steel Typing gives it a good matchup against Fluttermane, which remains one of the most common Pokemon in the entire game. The wide array of coverage moves it has access to, like Stomping Tantrum, Ice Punch, and Hammer Arm, let it threaten the common Intimidators. 
and Bullet Punch still gives it a solid priority move to KO faster, weakened Pokemon with. It's still early since Metagross was added into Scarlet and Violet, but I truly think it has the potential to have a number of strong showings in high-level tournament play. While it may not be amongst the absolute top tier of Pokemon like it used to be, like Fluttermane, Incineroar, and Urshifu currently occupy, it should fall somewhere in the tier below them, as a strong yet bulky Pokemon capable of giving teams a safe option to pivot into thanks to its typing's numerous resistances. Only time will tell how Metagross truly fares in the Terrastal era of competitive Pokemon. But one thing is certain, it's unlikely to ever return to being the dominant threat and king of competitive Pokemon that it was in its heyday in generations 4 and 5.